Welcome to tonight's program. India and the Story of Blue, a part of the Discover India series. The program <clears throat> is series is brought to you through a partnership between the India Association of Greater Boston, the Shishu Bharati School, and the Burlington Public Library. And with the participation of public libraries in Acton, Andover, Marlborough, Tewksbury, and Westford. I would like to thank the members of the India Association of Greater Boston and Vineet Kumar, our presenter for the night, for the generous donation of their time and knowledge to make this series happen. You're invited to join us for the next program in this series, Hidden Gems, 10 Beautiful Places in India, on Monday, April 11th, starting at 7 p.m. If you enjoyed tonight's program, I would also invite you to tell a friend about it and help us spread knowledge of India's many cultural wonders. Tonight's program will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session. In order to ask questions, please feel free to do so at any time using the Q&A feature within Zoom, and your questions will be answered at the end of the program, time permitting. Joining me is Vaishali Gade, President of the India Association of Greater Boston, who will now introduce our speaker. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Vishali Gade. Good evening, all. Um, a little about IGB. IGB is one of the oldest organizations in New England area for Indian Americans to foster social, cultural, and community presence in New England area. We always strive to unify this diverse culture of ours here in America. IGB, in collaboration with Shishu Bharti, an elite Indian language school and culture school here in New England area, the Burlington Public Library and Indian Consulate General of New York are proud to bring a first of a kind Discover India series. Before I move forward to introduce this evening's speaker, I would like to express my immense gratitude to Shishu Bharati and my good friend Sheshi Shomapuram for all their help in, in making it happen. And also to Burlington Public Library and Michael Wick for making it available to many library patrons and to many other libraries, as well as helping us through many of the hurdles that we face through bringing this series on the Zoom webinar. Okay, now a little about Vinit Kumar, our presenter for tonight. Vinit Kumar lives in Lexington and on Sunday mornings, you'll find him teaching Indian culture at Shishubharati. One of his hobbies is writing children's stories. He also enjoys volunteering for the community. Though he calls himself a curiosity geek, each one of my conversation with him has been interesting, more and more thought provoking and super engaging. I'm confident you will thoroughly enjoy this virtual journey to India to understand the story of Blue with Vinit Kumar. Vinit ji, take it away. All right, thank you Vishali ji and thank you Michael for the warm introduction and the welcome. Uh, my name is Vineet Kumar and first of all a good evening to everybody or good afternoon if you are joining this session from elsewhere within the United States. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited to present to you the first of uh, many presentations as part of the Discover India series and today my goal is to share with you the topic of India and the story of blue. Now, normally, if you are not doing it uh, on Zoom, I will reach out to the audience and ask everybody, is everybody ready? So even though I can't hear you, just shout out, yay, and then we shall go on to the next slide here. So welcome again to India and the story of blue. So what exactly do we want to accomplish today? I kind of set out a couple of goals of our conversation today. First of all, I hope you will get to listen to an interesting story and that will take you on a figurative journey to a distant land, that is India. I also like for all of us to recognize that every corner of the world can give us something beautiful. And that is all the more motivation for all of us to embrace diversity 
And that will be apparent as you hear this interesting story today. And also, you know, we all need to realize that as humans and as cultures from around the world, we are all interconnected. And how? We always underestimate the level to which we have always been connected together. So I hope we can realize that as part of today's presentation. And lastly, have some fun and take away a couple of tidbits of information or something memorable that hopefully you will remember even 10 years from now. And if I can accomplish that, I would be very happy today. So let's get on with it. Since we're gonna be talking about colors, I thought I would start by asking a little bit or telling you a little bit about my impression of what do we mean by colors? So we talk about red and green and pink and orange. What do we mean by colors? Well, colors is the magical thing that happens when light reflects from an object and enters your eye and millions and millions of nerve cells fire off and tell your brain that, hey, you're seeing something green or you're seeing something yellow. So it is something quite magical. And Sir Isaac Newton, he was a scientist. He was one of the first scientists who really wanted to study colors. And he spent many, many, many years doing that. And his curiosity was inspired by one of the most colorful objects in nature. So think about it. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about. And you know, what do you think is one of the most colorful objects in nature? Well, I'll tell you what it was. It was a rainbow. So he would look at the rainbow and he was mesmerized by it. He studied it. And he would frequently play with the prism. That's uh, something in your science uh, high school you would have seen. So he played around with the prism with normal light and he found that within the normal light, he could find seven different colors. So that was very exciting to him. So if you remember your high school science, you know, Newton's uh, seven major colors. So he actually listed these seven colors and uh, you know, uh, your science teacher may have used the mnemonic Vibgyor, V-I-B-G-Y-O-R, as an easy way to remember the names of the seven colors that Newton uh, listed uh, that he found within white light. So what were those? I'm listing them out here. They are violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. And these first letters of all these words, they are captured in the mnemonic Vibgyor. And of course, you know, you know these colors. Violet is, is the color that is similar to deep purple. Indigo, of course, is, is the deep incarnation, is a deep blue incarnation. You see that here. And of course, the rest of the colors are very well known to you. So Vibgyor was something that uh, Newton came up with and uh, these seven colors have lingered on. And every time you see the rainbow, you can pretty much spot them. All right, now that we know some different colors that exist in nature, you also have known that uh, colors can be mixed. You know, anybody who's painted a little bit sometimes mixes colors to get new colors. And of course, you know, light can also be mixed. So. Anytime you mix two colors, you can get something new. And uh, science has recognized that uh, mixing two colors in paint and mixing two colors in light can be slightly different. So when you mix two different paints, you may get something different. And that is because mixing paints has a different kind of science than mixing light. All right. now. We want this session to be interactive. So as part of that, I set up a simple Zoom poll question. And in just a moment, uh, Mike will flash that uh, uh, question at you. Maybe Mike, just uh, I, I will read out the questions and then we can uh, maybe just minimize that for just a second. So uh, the question is, what is the most common color of soap or detergent that you might use to wash white colors 
And why is that? And I'm going to give you three choices. So read through the choices. And then once the question flashes, I like you to come up with the answer that you feel is right. The first choice is red. So some people may believe red is the most common color for soap or detergent that we might use to wash white colors. And it is because red detergent is easier to make and hence cheaper. Some of you may say, no, that's not right. I believe green is the most popular color for soap or detergent because it represents nature and natural ingredients. Or some of you may say blue is the most common color for soap or detergent that we use to wash white clothes because when white clothes get old and they look a little bit yellow, washing them with blue makes them look again and bright and shiny because blue and yellow gives us white. So go ahead and answer and we'll give you a few seconds to uh, answer that question. And uh, let's see if you get it right. So Mike, please uh, do monitor as our smart audience comes up with the right answers. Let's give them a few 10, 20 seconds so that they can answer in their uh, answers, A, B, or C. And then uh, we'll do a quick countdown. And let's do a quick countdown. So I'll count down from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So hopefully everybody's locked in their answers. And uh, Mike, can you close the poll and, and, and see what everybody came up with? Oh, wow. Looks like 93% of people say it is blue. And that is the right answer. So I know our audience is very smart. That's exactly right. Blue is the most popular color because uh, for detergents because uh, uh, blue and yellow mix gives us white. And as white clothes get a little bit older, you wash them many times, they turn a little bit of yellow. And then when you mix blue with it, you get it bright white again. So awesome. So I know our, our audience is very smart today. Let's keep going. All right, so humans, we see color all around us. So you take a walk in the park, you go anywhere you like. For hundreds and thousands of years, we have seen all kinds of bright colors around us. For example, in the garden, you might see red and yellow. Those are very popular colors for flowers. You can see green leaves and plants. And of course, you can see the bright blue sky. So no matter which way you turn, there's all kinds of bright colors all around you in nature. And in fact, ancient people, they started to consider red, yellow, and blue as some of the primary colors because they were very common and popular. And also you can imagine when ancient humans, they walked around, they saw all these colors, they would inspire them. So if they saw something red, they would come home and they say, hey, I want some red in my life. Maybe I'll paint my house red. Or if they saw something yellow, they might come home and say, hey, I want to have a yellow colored tablecloth on my table. So colors have ways of inspiring our day-to-day -day lives. That makes sense. So let's take an example of this very same specific topic. And this has to do with clothing. So if I were to look at ancient clothing, from many, many, many years ago, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years ago. And while I never lived 2,000 years ago, I got some old pictures from the internet. And I'm going to show you a few pictures of people's clothing from, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. So let's take a look. So here's one. Here's another one. Some more. Some kids' clothings a knight, and some other garments. Now, take a moment to look at them very carefully, and I'm gonna pose a question for you. What color amongst all of these seems to be missing? Now, you look around, and it's quite clear that there's one color missing from all of this. Perhaps you guessed it right, it is blue. And now I want to ask the question, 
Why is that the case? Why is blue missing from all these colors? Let's take a look. So the story is ancient humans found many, many, many sources and ways to make colors like red, yellow, green. And with these different colors, these pigments, these dyes that they could get of various colors, they would use them in their homes, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, in their daily life for coloring, for painting their homes, even for makeup, or even designing colorful clothes. And these red, yellow, green pigments, they would get them from nature, from minerals, from rock, from various places. Except for thousands of years, blue color was missing in everyday human life. People, people could see blue all around them, but there was no blue in the lives of everybody because they couldn't find blue colored pigments everywhere. And just to kind of highlight how life would have been if you did not have any blue color in your life, think about it. You picked up a box of paint and many colors in there. You see all the colors, but no blue. You want to go and paint something blue in your home. There is no blue. You wanted to get a blue colored dress. Sorry, you could have red, yellow, green, but no blue. And to make that even more conspicuous, I'm gonna share an example below of something which has many colors and see what happens if you change the colors slightly. So what I'm showing here is a picture of a beautiful peacock. Peacocks are very common in India. If you go to certain gardens, you will see peacocks wandering around and it's got, got, it's got all the colors. It's got green, it's got yellow, it's got red, it's got blue. Now imagine a painter, a master craftsman wanted to paint this picture and he had all the colors, but he had no blue. So let's take a look at a peacock who's lost its blue. This is how it would look like. So what do you think? Does this look as attractive as real life? Just to kind of show you side by side. What do you think? How would life be if suddenly blue were not available to you? I would say your life would not be as bright if there was no blue in your life. So, okay, that just uh, highlights the conundrum, the challenges that people for hundreds and thousands of years had. They had all colors, but they had no blue. And then something wonderful happens. Some magic happens. In India, people with some clever thinking and some discovery, they finally discovered how to get blue pigment. In many of the Indian dialects, it's called Neel. It is, it is a, a very deep blue color. And I'm showing you a picture of how this looks like. So you can see it's a very deep blue. So people in India were able to figure out how to get it. And this happened maybe a couple of thousand years ago. And I would say that even though people figured out it was a carefully guarded secret, even in India, only a very, very few people knew how to make this magical pigment powder that gives you this deep color. So they say maybe two, 3,000 years ago, when ancient Greeks as traders, they visited India, they found this mysterious blue pigment. They took it back with them to Greece and everybody in Europe, they loved the new color. And when everybody asked them, what is this color? What is this? The Greek traders started calling it Indicon. It means from India or the color from India. Now the Indicon name stuck on for many hundreds of years, but eventually as it got Latinized, people started calling it Indigo. So whenever somebody would ask, what is this color? They would say it's Indigo. It's the color from India. So now comes the interesting part. How on earth did the people of India make the indigo pigment? And to keep it interesting again, 
we're going to have a Zoom poll question number two, and I will read out the question, and then Mike will, um, uh, you know, share the Zoom poll, uh, and then you can answer whichever answer that you feel is most appropriate. So the question is, how did the people of India, how did they make this indigo colored pigment or powder? So some might argue option A is maybe this pigment came from a blue colored soil that was found on the beaches of a very special lake. And that's how we got this color. Some might say, no, it actually comes from a tree called real indigo. And the third choice is maybe it is mined from the deep caves, some special caves found in North India. So Mike, could you please activate the Zoom poll and let our audience figure out what is the right answer? So A is it comes from the blue colored soil found near a special lake. B is it comes from a special tree called real indigo. And third, it is mined from some special caves and the minerals from that that are found in North India. So go ahead and uh, fill out your, uh, you know, whichever uh, option you feel is most appropriate. And remember, don't feel afraid. Whatever you feel comes to your mind. And we'll give you 10, 15 seconds. Uh, and I'll maybe do a countdown here. So 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, three, lock in your answers, two, one, and zero. All right, Mike, let's see what the audience have to say. All right, so it looks like 68% of the audience, the largest uh, by far uh, of our audience feels that it is mined from the caves in North India. All right, so let's close that and share what is the right answer. Well, the right answer is it actually comes from a tree a special tree called real indigo. All right, some of you got it right, but uh, that's interesting. Yes, it's a little unusual. It does come from a special tree. All right, let's keep going. All right, now comes a little twist in the story. Now you know there is something called indigo and I want to introduce the British traders. So in the 1600s, there were some British traders who came to India and they also took back the indigo dye to their country, to Great Britain and to Europe. And when these traders took it back, everybody wanted more. And the best part was by then, the indigo dye could be made into small cakes. You know, I see some, see some pictures here. They are the size of uh, maybe a small ball, you know, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball, like a more like a ping pong ball. So you could make it into nice cakes and then it's easier to transport them. So the British traders would take them as these mini cakes, take them to Great Britain and everybody loved them. In fact, they loved them so much that the British traders, they tried to take the indigo tree, small saplings of them. And they said, well, let's take it back to Europe and plant them there. This way we don't have to come all the way to India and get it from here. But what do you think? Do you think the indigo tree really did very well in Europe? Well, the short answer is it really did not grow very well. And the reason was the climate of Europe is relatively cold or cooler than India. And as a result, the, the tree would grow there, but uh, you wouldn't really get the pigment that was strong enough to do anything with it. So as a result, the British traders kept coming back to India and they wanted more and more of this indigo dye this pigment. And in fact, they started coming in such large numbers. And when they would come here, others would look for other things. The British traders, they wanted to buy as much indigo as they could find. In fact, indigo was often called as blue gold. And the value of, you know, one ounce of indigo was more than one ounce of gold. So you could imagine if you had a gold coin on one side and an indigo cake on the other, 
everybody would have to pick up the indigo cake or this piece of cake, uh, this piece of indigo uh, dye, because that would be more valuable than gold. So you can imagine it was quite remarkable. Now, times changed, few years went by. In the 1700s, the British were ruling India. India was a colony of the great British empire. And the British, they quickly had been realizing the importance of indigo. And they also realized that indigo, when they used them in many ways that they wanted to, it had some special properties. So while of course they could make great clothing. So for example, you see this lady here wearing a nice indigo colored dress. That was certainly one of the reasons why the British uh, traders and the British citizens, they loved the indigo that they could get from India. They also realized this indigo was not just a dye, just not just a color, it was something special. So let's take a guess. And all of our audience is very bright. So if I were to give you some two, three, uh, just some, some uh, hints, this is not a poll, but just I want to give you some hints and ask you, which of these do you think might be true about the Indian indigo pigment? Let me see if you can spot the special properties of indigo. For example, it was the only color at that time that would not fade in the sun. So you would wear this color, so this lady could wear this dress and walk on the sun and the color would not fade. As you know, in those days, uh, if you wore something colorful in the sun for too long, you know, the colors might fade away, but indigo did not do that. Do you think that is the right answer? Or indigo was so powerful that it could color any fabric. So whether you had a cotton dress, a silk dress, a woolen dress, a woolen dress or something else, it could dye or color just about anything. At that time, most other colors and pigments could only color cotton or only color silk, but indigo could do it for every kind of clothing. Or do you think this indigo dye was so special that even if you washed it many, 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 many tens and hundreds of times, it would not fade away very easily. So these are some of the properties of something special. And if you had to guess, maybe in your mind, think about it. What do you think is the right answer? Actually, this question is a trick question. The answer is all of the above. So the British uh, citizens and the normal people who would use this, they found that not only would it last forever for many, many washes, not forever, but for many washes, it could be used for any fabric and it wouldn't fade in the sun. So they really found this to be extra special. And one group of people who found it extra special was the British Navy. So then Brit the British Navy, they had a problem. So, you know, the Navy, uh, the crew, the sailors, everybody, you know, they, they wander around across the oceans and often they get wet and seawater is salty and seawater is quite aggressive. So when sailors would get their clothing wet uh, or with salt water, they would find that their clothing wouldn't last very long. But in 1748, the British Navy found that if you use the indigo dye, your clothing would last for a very long time. So wouldn't it be a great idea to use the Indian indigo for the clothing? And in 1748, they did that. So at that time, there's this famous picture of the, the Royal Navy, of the, the British Royal Navy. They, they picked a new color for their clothing and that clothing was dyed with the Indian indigo. And they called it the Navy Blue. The Navy Blue stands for the blue that is used by the British Navy. And even today, many people look at this color and they say, hey, I want a Navy Blue colored pant or a dress or a clothing. So the Navy Blue, had its origin in 1748 and became very popular. So what do you think that did to the demand for the indigo dye? Do you think people wanted more of it or less of it? Well, the answer is obvious. Once the British Navy started using lots and lots of indigo dye from India, the demand for indigo dye just shot up through the roof. 
now, a few more years tick by, this is the 1800s, and the British were ruling in India, and their problem was, we want more. We cannot get enough of this dye. So one of the things that happened, unfortunately, is that the, the, the British uh, rulers, they captured some land in the eastern state of Bengal. That's a, a state towards the east of India. And in the state of Bengal, uh, indigo could be grown. It's a popular place to grow indigo dye. And the farmers there were told that, please grow indigo trees and forget about growing rice and food. Now, you might say, well, some people would do that. But many other farmers wanted to have rice and, and wheat and other things to grow. But the British forced the farmers to grow only indigo. And of course, this led to some famines. And when there were famines, you cannot eat anything from the indigo tree, right? You need rice and wheat. So that caused a lot of problems. And when some of the farmers revolted, the British uh, army would trouble them. And many farmers starved to death. And there was nobody to help them. So that's quite unfortunate. And they say, you know, several leaders of India, including uh, one of our very popular leaders, Mahatma Gandhi, which you may have heard about, heard of, he went to Bengal to help the farmers of India who were forced to grow indigo and they were protesting. So Gandhi was a big part of that to try to help their situation. All right. So we learned a little bit about history. Now let's get to some practical stuff as well. So how does the Indian indigo tree really look like? So I got a picture here, you can see on this right here. So the Indian indigo tree is called real indigo. It's got a scientific name here. And the question is, where exactly which part of the tree produces the blue pigment? There's often confusion around that. Some people believe does it come from the flowers which are crushed to produce the color? Is there something special in its root? Well, the answer is it's none of them. It's actually the green leaves in the tree, on the tree, is what contains this pigment. So these leaves, these green leaves have maybe half a percent of this pigment, this blue pigment. And you got to do something special it takes about a week to actually cook and ferment the leaves. You can see this picture of a person fermenting the leaves. It takes many days. At the end of that, you get this blue pigment. So you look at the leaves. You can never tell that there's blue color hiding in it, but it is there. And it needs a very special process to generate. All right. So now demand grows. More and more people want this indigo color. Some countries even start growing this indigo, other countries other than India. And then there's one very unusual event that happens that causes the demand to explode even further. Very, 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 very popular. And I like to give you a couple of seconds to think about it before I give you the answer. So what was that one event where the demand for indigo dye was already very high and then it just went through the roof. Can you think of something? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Let me tell you the answer. It was the introduction of genes. So in around 1880 or 1875, Levi Strauss created genes. And guess what color he picked for his genes? It's this very popular deep blue color. He picked blue denim for his jeans. And indigo colored jeans, these blue color on the denim came from using indigo. And it was very popular amongst everybody. The cowboys, the people of United States, everybody wanted blue jeans. And what do you think that did to the demand of the Indian indigo dye? Well, of course it went through the roof. So, Demand is growing, keeps growing. So how did the indigo story end? You would have thought that the demand for indigo kept going further and further. So this is our third and final poll question. So just before India got independence in 1947, this is a picture of uh, you know when India got independence. What happened? What changed so that the indigo demand changed dramatically? 
A, was blue color no longer fashionable? So the demand for indigo dropped. Or B, indigo became so expensive that nobody could afford it. So people stopped buying it. Or C, a German scientist discovered a way to make artificial indigo dye, which was just as good as natural indigo. So the demand for the Indian indigo reduced. So what do you think? So let's figure out. So Mike, do you want to populate the poll, please? So go ahead. So A is blue indigo was not fashionable. So people stopped buying it. Or it became too expensive. Or C, a German scientist discovered a way to make artificial indigo dye, which was just as good as the natural indigo. So let's give ourselves 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Lock in your answers. 2, 1, and 0. All right, Mike, let's see what our audience has to say. Wow. 94% say it was because a German scientist came up with the artificial indigo dye. You got it. That's really, really the right answer. So I'm impressed. All of you guys figured it out. So that is the reason why the indigo popularity started dropping around 100 years ago. Now, Fast forward to today, 2022, and you wanted some indigo dye. Could you get it? The answer is, of course you could get it. If you walked into your favorite store, you could get a bottle of indigo dye. It's liquid. You know, maybe it uses artificial indigo, not the real one. In India, sometimes you get boxes that look like this. They contain a powder. I'm not quite sure. It might be a mix of the artificial or the, or, the, or the natural one. There are also other brands like uh, Mrs. Stewart's also, which is a liquid that you can buy today. And as I was doing research, I found another very interesting bottle that you could find. It's indigo, it's natural. And it says natural hair dyeing. So what does that mean? People have figured out that indigo can be used to color your hair. And I show a picture here of something very popular. So here's a lady here who's used uh, something called henna to dye her hair. And you can see the brownish color. And the same girl has uh, used indigo to dye her hair. Now her hair hasn't turned blue, but you can see it's turned a nice dark color. So indigo today is used heavily for people who want to dye their hair. But remember, indigo dye that you use to color your hair has always got to be the natural one. Do not use artificial dye, artificial indigo to dye your hair, otherwise your hair can get damaged. So one of the common uses of natural indigo even today is to dye your hair to get a dark color. So in summary, the story of indigo is very interesting. Indigo is a unique deep blue color that got its name from India. And in fact, Turkey and India are the only two countries to have a color named after it. India obviously is indigo and Turkey has got the turquoise color that comes from Turkey. Indigo comes from green leaves of indigo trees. It needs a special recipe. And until 100 years ago, the Indian indigo was the best in the world and valued just like gold. And there was a high demand for it. And this was one of the main reasons why the British who were ruling India, they did not want to leave India because they felt they could make a lot of money by selling the Indian indigo. But today, artificial indigo is easier to get and cheaper and used by many people. And if you are wearing a blue pair of jeans or you have one in the closet, remember, it gets colored using indigo, but probably artificial indigo. And if you're using uh, anything to dye your hair, remember natural dye is better than the artificial one in one way. And that is if you want to dye your hair. So that is a short summary of what we covered today. And that brings us to the end of the talk. I hope you enjoyed 
India and the story of blue. I thank you very much for your attention and I hope you got something useful out of it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Vinny. That was an excellent uh, presentation. I learned quite a bit tonight. I really appreciate that. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, the uh, One of the questions was asking to see the indigo tree. Uh, I know that we saw uh, the plant. I'm, I'm assuming it's a plant, not a tree. Is that correct? Yeah, it's it's like a bush gum tree. You know, uh, I would say uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty large sized uh, bush, you could say almost like a small tree. Uh, and uh, I think uh, there are a couple of different kinds, but uh, it's a good healthy size. Interesting. And uh, I think someone else was uh, uh, mentioning uh, color uh, combinations. So if anybody has any other questions, uh, feel free to ask in the question and answer uh, section here. Oh, here we go. We have another one. Uh, what about the Phoenician blue dye? Was that indigo? Um, it could have been. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with that. Uh, it's possible. Um, I must admit, uh, that's not something I have uh, really researched very well, but uh, I'll look that up. That's now, one question. other thing just to point out. So I brought this little bottle here. I don't know if, I, if, if people can see it. This is how the bottle of indigo dye looks like. I got it from a local store. But remember, if you ever use it, don't pour a whole lot of it. One drop, that's about all it takes. It's very, very, very strong. Excellent. And uh, there's, there's someone who's asking, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the process of uh, how the leaves are, are, are processed actually to make the dye? So some of that secret uh, yes. that you mentioned. So uh, I only know it a little bit, so I'm, I'm gonna do my best to describe it. So what happens is they pluck the leaves and they boil it in water and they let it ferment. Ferment means let it rot. And as it rots, it stinks a little bit and it changes color a little bit. And then what happens is they, I think that goes on for several days. And uh, then they add some chemistry to it. I think like lime or something else like that. And then rapidly, that color changes and you begin to see some blue stuff coming out of it. And then, you know, you, you kind of uh, strain it or something like that. That's very roughly speaking how I believe it to be. But uh, this is a little bit of a hand, uh, homegrown secretive process. So I'm only giving you the very uh, basic steps here or something along those lines. Well, and, and an interesting question that follows up to that, um, that process, how do people discover uh, that process or that the leaves uh, contain blue dye, especially as I, as they I, are? I'm sure it was accidental. I'm sure, you know, as, as with the, you know, anything that is unusual and interesting, somebody did something wild and wacky and something magical came out of that. And then it was a carefully guarded secret. Nobody knew about it. That would be my guess. Uh, and this has been in place for at least two or 3000 years ago. So the exact origins of the person who first found it Nobody really knows. It's probably a family secret that uh, probably grew over time. Yeah. And uh, so how do you make uh, shades of blue? Ah, shades of blue. So probably some mixing, perhaps. Uh, uh, the typical cake or the powder is deep blue. And my guess is uh, those who are clever, they probably can mix it. You know, I think... Uh, um, that would be my guess. You know, we learned or we know that colors can be mixed to, to kind of create shades. Uh, and uh, that would be my guess. Uh, I'm not a color expert here, but uh, probably you mix blue with some other pigment and then you can get different shades. And I also what I believe is that uh, depending on how the crop is grown, so this is grown. And if you had a good season, the color might be a little bit darker. If you water the plant too little or there was a drought, you know, sometimes the blue will be a little bit lighter. So not every tree will give you the exact same color. So my guess is there's also shades of blue depending on where the crop is grown. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so on to uh, questions about Indian culture and uh, the color blue. Uh, the question is, did Indians revere indigo as much as outsiders? Is it connected to Shiva being blue? Um, hmm, interesting question. I think uh, 
in India, the blue was more common because it had been part of life. People knew it existed. Uh, remember in those days, if blue was very common in India, rest of the world had no way of knowing that, right? It's only when traders would come and take it back and they would say, hey, I found this magical thing. Then the rest of the world found it as a very rare luxury. As I read uh, research is what I found is royalty, kings and queens would be the only people who would say, hey, yeah, I love this, this, this color, you know, where did you get it? Uh, but in India, because it was grown there, many more people would have been familiar with it. So I wouldn't say blue was extra special, but it was just that it originated there and people would know it. And even old grannies would use a little bit of that when they would wash their clothes. Hmm. Yeah, familiarity kind of uh, doesn't make it as special, I guess, in that instance. <laughs> that would be my best guess. Yeah. Um, so uh, a question about how did it get the name Neil? So Neil actually is uh, in one of the Indian languages. It's a color. It's a name for blue. So my guess is uh, the, the word Neil, N-E-E-L. It, it, it sounds like the name of a person, Neil, N-E-I-L. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil is uh, in, in one of the most popular Indian languages in Hindi. Neil means blue. Mm -hmm. Neela means bluish. So mm -hmm. uh, my guess is uh, that would have been uh, like a colloquial word for, you know, that's what we would call it. Uh, that would be my guess. Yeah. And uh, we have one last question here. Uh, might be uh, too big of a question. It would give birth to other uh, <laughs> programs. Uh, how did they make other pigments? Ah, interesting. So uh, what I understand is that uh, other pigments like uh, green, no, yeah, green, and, no, not sorry, green, uh, yellow and red were often extracted from flowers, natural flowers, you know, like some uh, pigments, uh, yellow flowers are very common, red are very common, and I'm not quite sure exactly what uh, flowers were used, but that's my best guess. Green was very challenging. And I believe green uh, originated from something that was uh, copper based or some, some mineral. It was a little bit poisonous. Uh, that came uh, maybe in somewhere in Europe, as, as I remember. So yellow and red were the most common. Green was a little bit rarer and blue, of course, was super rare. Excellent. Looks like there's one last question that came sure. in uh, and then uh, we can wrap up. Uh, it says the term royal blue was used when only royalty was allowed uh, to use that color. So I guess not so much a question as a statement. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the royal blue may have been, uh, you know, a, a word coined uh, or a phrase coined to kind of talk about the fact that uh, only, you know, the very uh, rich and, and very well-to-do people could afford, uh, you know, dresses and clothing of that kind. But navy blue was something interesting that I found out. I actually, until recently, hadn't realized, you know, the origins of navy blue. But today, you know, I know my uh, kids, uh, they go to a school, they're supposed to wear navy blue color for a certain occasion. I actually had no idea how it originated. So that's how the whole thing is connected. So actually, one of the things that I now recognize is many of the things that we think about that we are not aware of, you know, you connect the dots and all of a sudden you see a picture and you say, hey, I know this picture. I know why jeans were very popular. And I know now that, uh, you know, that's why the indigo became very popular. And next time you have uh, jeans, uh, you know, probably uses uh, artificial indigo, but you can relate to why in those days in 1870, if somebody saw a blue pair of jeans, they said, wow, this is the best thing since sliced bread became very, very, very popular. Well, and in, in the uh, COVID world of working from home, uh, I certainly became more familiar with the blue jeans and, and whatnot. <laughs> so. For sure, for sure. For well, sure. thank you so much, Vineet. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank and you. I'm looking forward to continuing our next presentation in May. Uh, so our follow-up presentation to this will be on Monday, April 11th starting at 7 p.m. Uh, Rupesh Mathur is going to be pr uh, giving us a tour of India, uh, Hidden Gems, 10 Beautiful Places in India. So I hope everybody will be able to join us for that. If you'd like to sign up, please visit your local library or visit the Burlington Public Library on, at burlingtonpubliclibrary.org and you can register for the programs there. So thank you very much to IAGB, all of our partners, 
uh, and Vineet uh, for the wonderful presentation. I hope everybody enjoyed it and has a wonderful night. Take care.